Amen. Amen. We're going to do some reading so that when we are making references, we can all understand. We're going to take it again. Uh, the book of Daniel chapter 8. Let's read the book of Daniel chapter 8 and um, chapter 11. Two chapters. So, let our sister help us read it. Uh, the book of Daniel chapter 8. Daniel chapter number 8. That is where we are focusing today. Then when we finish chapter 8, then we just go to chapter 11. Let's read it quickly. Daniel chapter 8. Daniel chapter 8, I read in Jesus' name. In the third year of the reign of the King Belshazzar, a vision appeared unto me, even unto me, Daniel, after that which appeared unto me at the first. And I saw in a vision, and it came to pass, when I saw that I was a Shushan in the palace, which is in the province of Elam, and I saw in a vision, and I was by the river of Olai. Then I lifted up my eyes and saw, and behold, there stood before the river a ram, which had two horns, and the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher came up last. I saw the ram pushing westward, and northward, and southward, so that no beast might stand before him, Neither was there any that could deliver out of his hand. But he did according to his will and became great. And as I was considering, behold, and he goat came from the west on the face of the whole earth and touched not the ground. And the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. And he came to the ram that had two horns, which I had seen standing before the river, and ran unto him in the fury of his power. And I saw him come close unto the ram, and he was moved with color against him and smote the ram and brake his two horns. And there was no power in the ram to stand before him. But he cast him down to the ground and stamped upon him. And there was none that could deliver the ram out of his hand. Therefore the he goat waxed very great. And when he was strong, the great horn was broken. And he came up four notable ones toward the four winds of heaven. And out of one of them came forth a little horn, which was exceeding great, toward the south and toward the east and toward the pleasant land. And it was great, even to the host of heaven. And it cast down some of the host and of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them. 11. Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of the sanctuary was cast down. And an host was given him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression. And he came down to the truth to the ground, and he practiced and prospered. Then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto that certain saint which spake, How long shall the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? And he said unto me, Unto two thousand and three hundred days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. And it came to pass, when I, even I, Daniel, had seen the vision and sought for the, meaning, for the meaning, then behold, there stood before me as the appearance of a man. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of Olai, which called and said, Gabriel, make this man to understand the vision. So he came near where I stood. And when he came, I was afraid, and fell upon my face. But he said unto me, Understand, O son of man, for at the time of the end shall be the vision. Now as he was speaking with me, I was in a deep sleep on my face toward the ground. But he touched me and set me upright. And he said, Behold, I will make thee know what shall be in the last end of the indignation. For at the time appointed, the end shall be. The ram which thou sowest, having two horns, are the kings of Media and Persia. And the rough goat is the king of Gracia. And the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king. Now thou being broken, whereas four stood up for it, 
Four kingdoms shall stand up out of the nation, but not in his power. And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up. And his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. And he shall destroy wonderfully, and shall prosper, and practice, and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. And through his policy also, he shall cause the craft to prosper in his hand, and he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall destroy many. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without hand. And the vision of the evening and the morning which was told is true. Wherefore, shut thou up the vision, for it shall be for many days. And I, Daniel, fainted, and was sick certain days. Afterward, I rose up and did the king's business, and I was astonished at the vision, but none understood it. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And chapter 11, from verse 1. Chapter 11, from verse 1. Also I, in the first year of Darius the Medi, even I stood to confirm and to strengthen him. And now will I show thee the truth. Behold, there shall stand up yet three kings in Persia, and the fourth shall be far richer than they all. And by his strength, through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of Gracia. And a mighty king shall stand up, that shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. And where he shall stand up, the kingdom shall be broken and shall be divided toward the four winds of heaven and not to his posterity, nor according to his dominion which he ruled. For his kingdom shall be plucked up even for others beside those. And the king of the south shall be strong and one of his princes, and he shall be strong above him, and have dominion, and his dominion shall be a great dominion. And in the end of years, they shall join themselves together, for the king's daughter of the south shall come to the king of the north to make an agreement, and she shall not return the power of the arm, neither shall he stand, nor his arm, but she shall be given up, and they that brought her, and he that begot her, and he that strengthened her in these days. But out of a branch of her root shall one stand up in his estate, which shall come with an army, and shall enter into the fortress of the king of the north, and shall deal against them, and shall prevail. And also shall carry, and shall also carry captives into Egypt, their gods with their princes, and with their precious vessels of silver and of gold, and shall continue more years than the king of the north. So the king of the south shall come into his kingdom and shall return into his own land. But his son shall be stirred up and shall assemble a multitude of great forces. And what shall certainly come and overflow and pass through, then shall he return and be stirred up even to his fortress. And the king of the south shall be moved with color and shall come forth and fight with him, even with the king of the north. And he shall set forth a great multitude but the multitude shall be given into his hand. And when he had taken away the multitude, his hand shall be lifted up, and he shall cast down many, many ten thousands, but he shall not be strengthened by it. For the king of the north shall return, and shall set forth a great multitude, greater than the former, and shall certainly come after certain years with a great army and with much riches. And in those times, there shall many stand up against the king of the south, also the robbers of thy people shall exalt themselves to establish the vision that they shall fall. So the king of the north shall come and cast up a mount and take the most faint cities, and the arms of the south shall not withstand. Neither shall his chosen people, neither shall there be any strength to withstand. But he that cometh against him shall do according to his own will, and none shall stand before him. And he shall stand in the glorious land, which by his hand shall be consumed." He shall also set his face to enter with the strength of his whole kingdom, and upright ones with him, thus shall he do. And he shall give him the daughter of women, corrupting her, and she shall not stand on his side, neither be for him. After this shall he turn his face unto the eyes, and shall take many, and the prince of, for his own behalf shall cause the reproach offered by him to cease. Without his own reproach, 
he shall cause it to turn upon him. Then he shall turn his face toward the fort of his own land, and he shall stumble and fall and not be found. Then shall stand up in his estate, a razor of Tarsus, in the glory of the kingdom. But within few days he shall be destroyed, neither in anger nor in battle. But in his estate shall stand up a vile person, to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom, but he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. And with the arms of a floor shall they be overflown from before him, and shall be broken, yea, also the prince of the covenant. And after the plague made with him, he shall walk deceitfully, for he shall come up and shall become strong with a small people. He shall enter peaceably, even upon the fattest places of the province, and he shall do that which his fathers have not done, nor his father's fathers. He shall scatter among them the prey and the spoil, and the riches, yea, and he shall forecast the, his devices against the strongholds, even for a time. And he shall stir up his power and his courage against the king of the south with a great army. And the king of the south shall be stirred up to battle with a very great and mighty army. But he shall not stand, for they shall forecast devices against him. Yea, they that feed with a portion of his meat shall destroy him, and his army shall overflow, and many shall fall down slain. And both of these kings' hearts shall be to do mischief, and they shall speak lies at one table, and it shall not prosper. For yet the end shall be at the time appointed. Then shall he return into his land with great riches, and his heart shall be against the holy covenant, and he shall do exploits and return to his own land. At the time appointed, he shall return and come toward the south, and it shall not be as the former or as the latter. For the ships of Chittim shall come against him, therefore he shall be grieved and return, mm -hmm. and have indignation against the holy covenant. Mm -hmm. So shall he do. He shall even return and have intelligence with them that forsake the holy covenant. And the and arms shall stand on his path, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that make it desolate. And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt with flatteries. But the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. 33. And they that understand among the people shall instruct many, yet they shall fall by the sword, and by flame, and by captivity, and by spoil many days. Now where they shall fall, they shall be hoping with a little help, but many shall cleave to them with flatteries, and some of them of understanding shall fall to try them, and to purge, and to make them white, even to the time of the end, because it is yet for a time appointed. And the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every other go every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods, and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished, for that that is determined shall be done. Neither shall he regard the god of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any god, for he shall magnify himself above all. But in his estate shall he honor the God of forces, and a God whom his father knew not shall he honor with gold and silver and with precious stones and pleasant things. Thus shall he do in the most strongholds with a strange God whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory, and he shall cause them to rule over many and shall divide the land for gain. And at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a wild wind with chariots and with horsemen and with ships, and he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. He shall enter also into the glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown. But these shall escape out of his hand, even Edom and Moab and chief of the children of Ammon. He shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. But he shall have power over the treasures of good, and of silver over all the precious things of Egypt, and the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps. But tidings of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore he shall go forth with great fury to destroy 
and utterly to make a way many. And he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas in the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end and none shall help him. Uh, may the Lord have Lord. blessing to the reading of his word. Praise the Lord. It's a Bible study, so we really truly need to listen very well. The Bible says, study and show thyself approved. Unto who? I'm emphasizing it. Unto who? Unto God. A workman that need not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Now why I say uh, that you should show yourself approved unto God. I have a reason for saying that. Those of us who have been long in the end time message. There are certain teachers of this scripture, of this message. That we have so much regard for. Including the prophet William Marion Branham. And so much until whatever we do in the ministry. Whatever we teach. We have this man of God that we have so much respect for. It's natural. It's normal. Every, every human being, every student wants to come under a teacher. Am I correct? And no good student wants to know more than his teacher. So that you can continue to learn under him. Then, but that pushes us when it comes to the things of God to an extreme where the denominations have the same kind of problem. The person that you have respect for says baptism is in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost is the general overseer. And you, so the school teacher, you are coming to say you, you read something and then you saw that it's in the name of Jesus, they will persecute you. That is the problem enter message pastors around the world have with me. All of us are supposed to come and continue from where we receive the message and continue. Don't bring anything new. The first thing they had with me was that I said women should cover their hair. I am stressing something so that you will know who is teaching you today. And all the four enter message churches I belong and all the ones I've visited around the world, the women don't cover their hair. They believe that the hair is that covering referred to in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. But one day as this ministry started and I became the pastor, I looked at the Bible again and I saw that it is a veil. That cover means veil. Amen. So I came and I said, this is what I believe and this is how it should be. That was the first problem I had with them. All intermediate churches, they don't cover their hair. Why are you coming with a different something? That is their problem with me. Therefore, I am in error. Not by Bible standard, but by the acceptable tradition that we met. Praise the Lord. So me, I want to study to be show myself approved unto God. So judge what I say from the Bible. Judge what I say from the Bible. Not from your tradition where you came from. So that we will flow and that is why denominations cannot catch these restored revelations. They are caged there in their own ideas. And I know that several people all around the world are believing what I'm teaching and I will be held responsible for what I teach. 
and I must not mislead the people. I have decided to make, and knowing that I am going to say so many things that is contrary to what so many people say, and even William Abraham himself. I stand there for the risk of <laughs> of being dealt with. Praise the Lord. Amen. But I want to be approved unto God, not unto man. So please, don't bring a quote to challenge me. Bring scripture to challenge me. Amen. Praise the Lord. So let's continue our study now. We have read it. There's a reason why we read it so that we can just go through it because I have some things I want to say. You will notice that in chapter 8 and from verse 15, let me stress something here. Take note. Daniel was given a vision and it came to pass. When I, even I, Daniel, had seen the vision and sought for the meaning, then behold, there stood before me as the appearance of a man. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of Ulai, which called and said, Gabriel, make this man to understand the vision. Oh, glory be to God. Hallelujah. So he came near where I stood, and when he came, I was afraid and fell upon my face. But he said unto me, Understand, O son of man, for at the time of the end shall be the vision. Hallelujah. Now, as he was speaking with me, I was in a deep sleep on my face towards the ground, but he touched me and set me upright. And he said, Behold, I will make thee know what shall be in the last end of the indignation. For at the time appointed, the end shall be. So, take note that this vision that is given to Daniel, our thought have begun. So, take note of what I'm, where I'm going. The thought has begun. Take note that this vision that was given to Daniel is to be fulfilled at the end. End of what? End of the four kingdoms, the fourth kingdom, or better still, end of the times of the Gentile that was revealed to Daniel through the image of Nebuchadnezzar, the four kingdoms. Take note. It's not to be fulfilled in the days of Daniel. It's not to be fulfilled in the days of the first kingdom, Babylon. It's not to be fulfilled in the time of the uh, 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 Medo Persian Empire, and it's not even to be fulfilled in the time of the Grecian Empire. It will be fulfilled at the end of time, and the end of time will be the end of the fourth kingdom. And take note that the end of the, the, the times of the Gentile is the end, the last three and a half years. The last three and a half years is when the Antichrist that the book of Daniel, God has been trying to let him trace the Antichrist. That is when the fullness of that will be manifested. Therefore, have it at the back of your mind that what God showed Daniel in chapter 8, you will go to chapter 11, is the same story repeated. The emphasis there is a particular king. That particular one is expressed, is, is revealed to Daniel in chapter 8, and in chapter 11 again, things that he will do is given to Daniel again to understand so that the interest is on that particular king. Amen. But the interesting thing is that the vision is to be fulfilled at the end, the time of the end. And in verse 26 of chapter 8, he says, and the vision of the evening 
and the morning which was told is true. Wherefore, shut up the visions, the angel was telling Daniel, for it shall be for many days. That is, it is going to last long. The time before it will come to pass is in great future. It's not at the time that you are seeing this vision. Now, this is the interpretation of the vision that he saw. Verse 20. Up to verse 25. The ram which thou sowest, having two horns, are the kings of Media and Persia. And that is the kingdom that took over from uh, Belshazzar, the king of Babylon, for the second kingdom that will rule the earth to take over. And that ram with two horns is Mediopatia. Verse 21. And the rough goat, amen, that came and destroyed the ram with the two horns is the next kingdom. Is a king of Grecia. That is the Grecian Empire, Greece, that took over from the Medopatian Empire. And the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king. Praise the Lord. And that first king of the Grecian Empire is Alexander the Great. And Alexander the Great was from BC 536 to BC 323. And he started to rule from the age of 20 years. And he died at the age of 33 years. Verse 22. Now that being broken, whereas that is Alexander the Great, as we see the story, the vision that you saw, this interpretation of the vision, that's why I took time for us to read so that we can be making references. Now that being broken, whereas force stood up for it because that uh, 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 that goat, amen, with one horn like that, that was broken, Alexander the Great, out of it, four kingdoms shall stand up out of the nation, but not in his power, not in his strength, the type of strength that he had. Praise the Lord. And it is history, all this is history, all this is in the history books. I try by all means, I wanted to be sure, and I take this in so seriously, I'm telling you throughout the night, from 11.30 in the night till I dress up to come to church, I have not slept. I have tried to read as many history as possible from all the books that I have to confirm this. And after the death of Alexander the Great, four of his generals divided the, his territory into four among themselves. That is what you see in verse 22. He said, now that being broken, whereas four stood up for it, four kingdoms shall stand up out of the nation, but not in his power. By the time that Daniel was seeing this vision, remember that all this had not taken place. It's history now that is making prophecy clear. Amen. And those four generals, the first one was General uh, Cassandra. He took Macedonia and the western part of the territory that Alexander had conquered Greece. The second one was Lysimachus. He took Thrace and the northern part of the territory. Thrace is the present day uh, uh, um, Bulgaria. The present day Bulgaria is what is known at that time as Thrace. Remember, 
with the history, some of these structures have changed. And then they told the general, Seleucus, he took uh, Syria and the eastern part. And as you read chapter 11, you continually hear the king of the north, the king of the north. And this king of the north is actually the king of Syria and Syria. But why is it that Seleucus took Syria and the eastern part? So there is, we are not careful, we will say that the king of the north cannot be Syria. No. Remember, it's Daniel. What is seen is a reference to the location of Israel. So Syria is in the north of Israel. So the king of Syria is the king of the north. But as far as the territory of Greece under Alexander was concerned, when his four generals divided them into north, south, east, and west, Syria fell in the eastern part of the territory of uh, Greece. And the fourth general, Ptolemy, he took Egypt and the southern part of the territory. Therefore, the four horns, they are named as Macedonia, Thrace, or present-day Bulgaria, Syria, and Egypt. Praise the Lord. Now, the fourth world empire that took over from Greece is Rome. So later on, Rome, by the time Rome came and conquered all these territories, he also absorbed all those four kingdoms. The last of those four kingdoms to be taken was Egypt. Rome conquered Egypt in B.C. 30. In B.C. 30. Praise the Lord. And according to Romans, I mean sorry, Daniel chapter 8, verse 9 to 12. Let's read it. He said, and out of one of them, one of those four kingdoms that broke out from Alexander's kingdom, one of them, Macedonia, Thrace, Syria, and Egypt. And out of one of them came forth a little horn, which works exceeding great towards the south and towards the east, and towards the pleasant land. And it works great, even to the host of heaven. And it cast down some of the hosts and of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them. Yeah, he magnified himself, even to the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. And an host was given him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression, and it cast down the truth to the ground, and it practiced and prospered. Praise the Lord. And according to history, this person referred to here from verse 9 to verse 12, as you look at the history, it, it came from Syria. And it is one of those princes, one of those kings by the name of uh, uh, Antiochus Epiphany. It's a popular history. Every theologian knows that. Every theologian knows that. I'll just read a little from uh, a write-up from the book Behold the Antichrist that uh, Pastor Enoch Onyeboha pastor in a church somewhere in Port Harcourt wrote years back. I also edited this book. I forwarded the book. In fact, I sponsored the production of the book years back before this church started. And I understand that when this book was released, even uh, 
Somewhere, I think, uh, uh, one of these denominational juggernauts, Oyedeko, I was told, that he lifted it up in one of his congregations and said, if you wanted to know the Antichrist, he said he recommended that book for people to go and read. Well, unfortunately, uh, we are falling out with Pastor Enoch <laughs> because my sisters are covering hair And because I refuse to follow him in the revelation of John. So we fell out. He, he, he considers me a deceiver that I'm deceiving the people. But each time I make reference to this book, the only copy I have, I've given all out. I even got this copy from our brother Patrick Onya. I had to collect your own. I don't even know where my own is. I called him two years ago. I'm, about two years or so ago, I called Enoch. I said, Enoch, anytime I make reference to this book, people call me from around the world, they want to buy it. Give me permission to print it. Because since he's declaring enemy, if I try to print it <laughs> without his permission, we shall end up in the Supreme Court. <laughs> and he told me he was updating it. And so, I waited, waited, six months after I called him Alpha, I thought maybe it is finance, and I offered that, just permit me, let me print it, or send the manuscripts to me of the revised edition you are making, so that I, I can just take, give it to a printer, or, print it, or you send it to your printer, and let the printer send me the bill. And I said, I assure you that I will not sell it. I will print it and give them out free. And then, yes, one excuse or the other months later, but the truth is, I got to know much later that he cannot print any book because he's under a bondage. He is following a man that believes that he is the leader now. The lead apostle. And the headship has to be established first. So anything you want to preach or say, you can only re-echo what he is preaching. You cannot bring your own. So he's the only one now permitted to write anything at all. That is the bondage, a gift like that has gone to catch. And you need to know this gift of this pastor Enoch I'm telling you about. He did not go beyond secondary school. But when that young man stands to talk, you think he has a doctorate degree. When he stands to write, and that was what I saw immediately, I grabbed him, he worked with me in the prison ministry, and then through that he was exposed to the country, and that is how he was known. But as soon as we fell out, devil made sure that gift is caged. That is the problem. But all things work together for good because even in the book he wrote, in the light of deeper revelation and insight I'm seeing now, he also repeated and just repeated what he had from somewhere. So that some things are not all uh, acceptable. And that is why, as soon as I finish this, we are putting it in book form. We shall have our own book. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. But so far, this is what he said. And I agree with him. The history now of Daniel chapter 8 verse 9, where he says, and I'm reading page 68, if you ever see that book, Behold the Antichrist by Enoch Oyebuaha. Daniel 8 verse 9, out of one of them came forth a little horn. That is what that verse says. Then he says, one of the four horns, listen very well, this is now history now that confirms prophecy. One of the four horns that produced the little horn is the Syrian kingdom ruled by the dynasty of Seleucus. The land of Israel has always been and always will be a center point in the layout of things in God's book, the Bible. And in his dispensational dealings with man, 
The empire of Greece was divided into four kingdoms ruled by those four generals, as you see in Daniel 8, 21 to 22. Out of these four, Egypt, ruled by the Ptolemy's Soto dynasty, stood at the south of the land of Israel and was therefore known as the king of the south. The king of the kingdom of Syria, ruled by the Seleucus uh, Nikato dynasty, stood at the north of Israel and was known as the king of the north. The activities of these two kingdoms and their kings as they crisscrossed the land of Israel in their battles and wars for supremacy and what to a large extent dominated the 11th chapter of Daniel. That's why I said Daniel chapter 11 is still a continuation of the activities of this, you know, breakout from the Christian uh, empire. He said, without going into so many details about the wars, the phobos and antics of the various kings or rulers in both dynasties, let us concentrate on the lineage of the king of the north, Syria, from where this little horn enamored and maltreated the pleasant land, Israel. Solutions and uh, Nicator's reign gave way to that of Antiochus the second. The one that we are referring to is Antiochus Ep the, the Epiphanes, is Antiochus the fourth. But he's trying to trace the dynasty. So I, I, I take it again. Seleucus Nicator's reign gave way to that of Antiochus the second, known as Pius. Seleucus the second began to reign later in place of Antiochus the second, his father. Seleucus the second died in BC 226. He had two sons, Seleucus the third and Antiochus the third, known as the great. Seleucus the third began to rule from BC 226 to 223, just three years. These two sons were referred to in Daniel 11 verse 10. Antiochus the third, the great, succeeded his brother to the throne. He ruled from BC 223 to 183, I mean 187. That is what we see in Daniel chapter 11 verse 18 and 19. Before he died in BC 187, the threat he represented to the southern kingdom of Egypt, or as the Bible puts it in Daniel 11, 18, they call it the reproach offered by him, was caused to cease in the battle of Magnesia in BC 190 by Lucius Cornelius Scopio Asiatokos, a priest like him. The next one in line to rule after Antiochus the third, the great, died was Seleucus the fourth. Philopato, uh, when uh, Daniel chapter 11 verse 20 said, then shall stand up in his estate a raiser of taxes in the glory of the kingdom, as we read. This referred to Seleucus the fourth, Philopato, who sent Heliodorus to go and collect taxes from Judea. The rest of that verse reads, quote, but within few days he shall be destroyed, neither in anger nor in battle, unquote. The few days this razor of taxes ruled was a very short time period, according to history, before he was poisoned by Helodorus. That is why it is written, quote, he shall be destroyed, neither in anger nor in battle, unquote. He was poisoned by Helodorus, a close associate of his. After Seleucus the fourth, Philopato died, verse 21 said, quote, and in his estate, that is in his place, shall stand up a vile person to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom. In other words, because of his evil nature, nobody offered him the vacant throne, even though his brother Seleucus the fourth, uh, Philopato, uh, left no heir to that throne. Quote again, but he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. So according to history, thus Antiochus the fourth Epiphanes took over the vacant Syrian throne by flatteries and deceit. And he could not have gotten it otherwise. It is this Antiochus Epiphanes that the Bible referred to as the little horn in Daniel 8 verse 9 that persecuted the pleasant land of Israel like no ruler from that dynasty 
before him did. He is also the one referred to as the vile person in Daniel 11 verse 21. And Daniel chapter 11 verse 22 speaks of how with the arms of a flood, that is military might, he overcomes all in his way. Yea, also the prince of the covenant. This refers to the time in history he tried to forcefully replace the ruling Jewish high priest. Now this is what Enoch is referring here. Praise the Lord. Okay. From verse 22 to verse 28 is the Bible's concise chronicle of the different wars, power plays, and wranglings that went on um, between him and the ruling king of the south, Plotomy, Philomento, and later Eugetes the second. This lasted for a number of years. And in verse 29, Daniel recorded, quote, at the time appointed, he, Antiochus Epiphanes, shall return and come towards the south, but it shall not be as the former or as the latter. As he came against Egypt this time, he did not have the victory as he did the earlier times or in the middle former battle that preceded this time as written in verse 28. That later time, swelling in his exploits, uh, swelling with his exploits and the success of it, Daniel wrote in prophecy, quote, his heart shall be against the holy covenant and he shall do exploits and return to his own land. This, unquote. Historically, he bitterly harassed the Jews on his return from that former battle. This latter time, as he returned to fight Egypt again, he did not have the victory as in the past. Why? Because verse 30, the first part of that, quote, for the ships of Shittim, unquote, that is Rome, then a rising power on the Mediterranean shall come against him. This time, the Roman fleet came against him, the assistance being engaged by Egypt, Antiochus Epiphanes was forced to surrender to the terms of Philippus, commander of the Roman fleet, to leave Egypt alone and also restore Cyprus to her. Antiochus, humiliated, agreed and on his way home to Syria, vented his furious anger on the land of Egypt and the land of Syria, uh, Israel. He vented his anger on the land of Israel. Then they had been celebrating over a rumor that he had died in that battle, but the rumor the rumor fatally proved untrue. The rest of Daniel 11 30 reads, quote, Therefore, he shall be grieved and return and have indignation against the holy covenant. So shall he do. He shall even return and shall have intelligence with them that forsake the holy covenant. That is the Jewish traitors walking on his side. And verse 31 says, Arms shall stand on his part. That is military might, in number, in arms, and so on. He had the upper hand. And they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength and shall take away the daily sacrifice and they shall place the abomination that make it desolate. At this time, Antiochus Epiphanes Antiochus Epiphanes went, this is this last place I want to read. This last paragraph I want to read. Take note. That is why it is Antiochus Epiphanes that is the priest that all this story, that vision, God was revealing to Daniel. At this time, Antiochus Epiphanes went into the Holy of Holies of Zerubbabel's temple and placed a sacrilegious image of Jupiter's Olympus. Killed swine big, ha, an unclean animal under the law on the brazen altar of sacrifice and forced the priests and other Jews to eat swine's flesh and drink the blood of pig, swine. Then, copies of the law he could find were defaced and destroyed. And that idolatrous image he placed there became the abomination that make it desolate. Spoken of by the prophet Daniel. It is an abominable thing. An abhorrent thing. Like placing an idol on Jehovah's throne. This made the temple desolate, deserted, forsaken 
and inaccessible to the Jews for as long as it was desecrated. This abomination that make it desolate is only a type or a pointer to the real abomination that make it desolate. The real one is still in future. And it's when the Antichrist will sit in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. As we see in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 4. This temple of God will be the third and final Jewish temple to be rebuilt on Mount Moriah. And that is where the temple mount is in the old city of Jerusalem. Where presently the Muslim mosque of Al-Aqusa is now situated. This shall happen in our very generation right after the translation of the sleeping and living saints. Unquote. Praise the Lord. So, Antiochus is that prince that is referred to as the little horn. Remember in Daniel chapter 7, there is a little horn also. Amen. And that little horn, blessed be the name of the Lord. That little horn is, as we saw in Daniel chapter 7, we trace it to be the Antichrist. And he's to manifest at the last, at the end of times. Or rather, the times of the end. The time of the end. Praise the Lord. So now, take note. What is God showing Daniel? What God is showing Daniel is a picture of how the Antichrist, the, uh, you know, how the end will be. He's showing him the end as determined for his people. He's showing him the Antichrist. Antichrist shall come. First John 2, 18 says so. You have had little children that Antichrist shall come. There are two important expectations of the Jews. The coming of the Antichrist and the coming of their Messiah. And they are watching out for it. And the Bible is just full of revelation that gives Israel that hope. The warning of the coming of the Antichrist. And the consolation that will be coming up by the Messiah. The coming of the Messiah. Because the Messiah is coming to establish a kingdom. And various prophecies and scriptures keep showing and proving who the Messiah is, how he will come, when he will come, where he will come. And the same thing also, God was showing a prophet, a dispensational prophet, Daniel, the Antichrist, how he will come, where he will come, his location, just his identity. And that is exactly what we're just trying to share. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Take note, amen, that in verse 23 of chapter 8, it says there that the horn will not rise until the latter time of their kingdom. When the transgressors are come to the full, and the transgression come to the full, these transgressors, they come to the full. They started somewhere. But their fullness is shown in Revelation, I mean Daniel chapter 12, the last chapter, verse 6 to verse 9. Daniel chapter 12, verse 6 to verse 9. Take note because we are tracing it. And one said to the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, how long shall it be to the end of these wonders. And I had the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever, that it shall be for a time, times, that is uh, two years, I mean making, time is one year, times is two years, and a half, that is three and a half years. And when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these 
things shall be finished. Praise the Lord. Verse 8. And I heard, but I understood not. Then said I, Oh my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And, that, and he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed. Till when? The time of the end. Therefore, when we see in verse 23, chapter 8 and verse 23, that the horn that will rise, that little horn, take note, that is where the confusion is. That little horn that will rise, hallelujah, he will not rise until the latter time of their kingdoms when the transgressors are come to the full. So let's look at it. If he say the latter times, then it means there is the former time. Amen. Of those four kingdoms. Praise the Lord. That is, there was a time that Macedonia, Thrace, Syria, and Egypt, they reigned. They existed. And that was when the, the four generals of Alexander the Great broke the Grecian kingdom into four. They existed. That is their former time. If there is going to be a latter time of these four kingdoms, it simply means towards the end, they will be existing again. And we know that when Rome came, he swallowed up all those kingdoms and they were all under Rome. But as Rome, as time came, when that beast broke up into ten horns, nations began to spring up and these same nations, today, they have back their identities. Macedonia is still in existence. Syria is still in existence. Egypt is still in existence. And Bulgaria is still in existence today as nations. So what he's saying is that this vision I'm giving you is that at the latter times, of these four kingdoms, that is when that little horn will spring up. Amen. Listen. Antiochus did not live in the latter times of those kingdoms. Correct? Because he was the eighth out of 26 kings that ruled Syria and he died in BC 164. Or he died 134 years before the last of the four kingdoms disappeared, which is Egypt, that disappeared in BC 30. So it cannot be referring this time to Antiochus Epiphanes. What does it mean? It simply means that Antiochus Epiphanes was only a shadow. Of the real Antichrist that we come, and exactly as Epiphanes, you know, works in wickedness, that is how that little horn that was revealed in chapter 7 that we trace to Rome, that is how that wicked king that we come up, that is how wicked he will be. So if you want to know how that king will be, look at Antiochus Epiphanes. Praise the Lord. Thirdly, it is true that Antiochus Epiphanes desecrated the temple. He desecrated the temple. But according to history, and many of us know that history of the Maccabees brothers, they rebelled and in BC 165, they restored again worship in that temple. Amen. But this little horn, okay, let me go ahead. Number four. The abomination that make it desolate. Spoken by Jesus in Matthew 24 verse 15. Can we read it? Matthew chapter 24 verse 15. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, Spoken of by Daniel the prophet, 
stand in the holy place. Who so readeth, let him understand. Amen. So that abomination that Jesus Christ spoke in where we read now, Matthew 24, verse 15, it was a future event. And that is to fulfill in future, but in AD 70, a shadow of it also came forth. We have thought several times that that scripture, abomination that make it desolate, was fulfilled in AD 70. Yes, in AD 70, General Titus came and dealt with, 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 with Israel until he came around the city of Jerusalem. And if you read that history, you will wonder how beastly human beings are. But you will, if you go back and read Zechariah chapter 11, then you will see the reason why he allowed that to happen. That's part of the transgression. It was because of their transgression. That is in Zechariah 11 where he was saying, and they sought for my price, and they weighed me, and they found me. What was his weight? His cost? His, it cost how much? 30 pieces of silver. Because of that, he allowed what happened to happen. A God of judgment. But even with that one still, what happened in 1870 was still a shadow of what will happen at the last three and a half years. When the Antichrist will now manifest in fullness. So, Matthew 24 verse 15 that Jesus spoke, he was not referring to Antiochus Epiphanes. He was still referring to what will happen when the Antichrist will manifest. And you should take note, according to that verse, when you read it, it says, and, uh, 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 you notice that Antiochus never, Antiochus Epiphanes never stood up against the priest of priests. If you read from verse 23 to verse 25, of Daniel chapter 8 where he described him Antiochus never stood up against the priest because but that priest that little horn the Bible says he stood up against the prince of princes and who is the prince of princes shout his name if you know it it's the Lord Jesus Christ amen Antiochus Epiphanes reign Christ was not even born yet and so, amen, it is just a shadow of the priest, the little horn that will come up like and with all the evil that was displayed with, by Antiochus Epiphanes, he would display it again. This time, he stood up against the priest of priests, Christ, in the Armageddon war where we see he gathered the nations in Revelation chapter 16, and verse 16, and then the war proper, we see it in Revelation chapter 17. You can read it from verse 9 up to verse 14. And that is where he stood up against the prince of princes. Amen. And Antiochus Epiphanes, he died anyway, 160 years before Christ was born. So, and then lastly, he was not broken without hands. Because if you read from verse 23 to 25, we're making reference to, hallelujah. This Antichrist that is coming, that little horn that is coming, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 8. This is how he's destroyed. Can we read it? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Because the Bible says broken without hands. That is, it's not a human being that will kill him. And then shall that wicked be revealed. 
whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Therefore, it is talking about the future. When Christ will be coming to end that nonsense, that wickedness, that is when his end will come. Praise the Lord. He, Antiochus Epiphanes was destroyed with hands. Certainly, he died a natural death at Tabi in Persia in BC 164. Therefore, hallelujah, Antiochus Epiphanes' activities, you will notice in verse 14 of Daniel chapter 8, he puts that abomination in the temple. How long? Can we read it? Daniel chapter 8. Verse 9. Let's read it from verse 9 up to verse 14. Just. And out of one of them came forth a little horn, as the horn we'll be looking at, which works exceeding great towards the south and towards the east and towards the pleasant land. And it was great even to the host of heaven and it cast down some of the hosts of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them. Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away and the place of the sanctuary was cast down. And an host was given him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression and it cast down the truth to the ground and it practiced and prospered. Verse 13. Then I had one saint speaking, and another saint said unto that certain saint which spake, How long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? Verse 14. And he said unto me, How long? Unto 2,300 days. Then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. How long history showed us that that Olympus goddess, what do you call it, the god, that hidden god, Olympus, that he took and came and put in the holy of holy sanctuary. It remained there for how long? 2,300 days Divided by 30 days in a month, you have about six years plus. Six years and three months. And according to history, that is the period that he drove everybody away until the Maccabean uh, revolt. But the Maccabees brothers, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. They came and ended that nonsense. The history of the Maccabees is very interesting. Try to read it. Just two people started. They are the, in fact, they are the, the, the veterans of guerrilla warfare. And before you know what, of course, you know, as you know, when God is with you, you don't need a large army to fight a battle. Go and ask Gideon. Praise the Lord. <laughs> and that is how they went and scattered that thing. Cleanse the temple again and then started worship. Therefore, Antiochus Epiphanes cannot be the Antichrist that is spoken of. He is only a shadow. Praise the Lord. Because that uh, 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 that period that he stood there, he's only speaking of a time. In his own case, it was 2,300 days, but when the real Antichrist will come, in Daniel chapter 12, verse 5, read it up to verse 9, let's read it so that you just get it. The period is given there. Daniel chapter 12 is the same thing that God was making clearer and clearer and clearer for him. Then I, Daniel, looked and behold, there stood other two, the one on this side of the bank of the river and the other on that side of the bank of the river. And one said to the man clothed in linen which was upon the waters of the river, how long shall it be to the end of these wonders? 
And I had the man clothed in linen which was upon the waters of the river when he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven and swear by him that liveth forever that it shall be for a time, times, and a half. And when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. So when you read it up to verse 9, Antiochus Epiphanes, his own was six years plus, but this one that he foreshadowed will be three and a half years. That the abomination that make it desolate. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And so, let me just pick a summary of what we are looking at. It is the revelation of the Antichrist. God decided to, to give Daniel a vision and all that he achieved in the whole book of Daniel the whole book of Daniel from chapter 1 up to chapter 12 is just to show him what would be the end of things. It was showing him a divine agenda. Amen. By the time we come back to chapter 9, there was another agenda that was given to Daniel. From verse 24. We will read it. We will get there. That one, don't know how long it will take us, just from verse 24 to verse 27, 28, 29. It's another divine agenda. But this one, a mystery, a secret rather, was being given to Daniel. And please, take note of something. Amen. When that revelation was given, you will notice that it was not something that Daniel even bothered to gather the Jews to tell them because at the time he was writing that they were under captivity. They would not allow them to gather. But he had it and God caused him to write these things down. If you permit me to say this, this revelation was not for Israel. This revelation is for you and for me. Hallelujah. And I'll tell you why. Because these are activities, events that will take place at the end time. As at the time that Daniel saw those four horns, he didn't even know what they meant. All he told him was four kingdoms shall arise. That's all. But which kingdoms? Daniel never lived to see which kingdoms they were. But history now has confirmed this. So what is prophecy? Prophecy is a history written in advance. <laughs> oh, this is our God. This is our God. I watched a little clip of a debate between a, a Muslim uh, teacher, what do you call them, rabbi, or what do you call them, imam, and one Christian man Maybe he's a theologist. And the Muslim was trying to convince him that the idea that a man went to die for the sin of other people that it is unreasonable. And if you listen to him, carnally, it's making sense. Intellectually, it is making sense. He's saying that if you say Jesus was the son of God, he sent Jesus to come and die for people. He said, then, then, then why do you, God that you say can do all things, has the power to do all things. Why are you limiting him until he cannot forgive unless he sent his son to come and suffer? He said, that does that make sense to you? That means God is so wicked that you pay somebody, an innocent person, to suffer. He said, then the crowd is clapping. He is making sense. Then the theologian is battling. is battling. is battling to show. He is quoting Bible. To show. He is quoting. And when you quote, and that Muslim imam knows Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Remember, they study it for that purpose. 
praise the Lord. And if you are listening to me, Christians, all over the world, we are not called to argue. Hallelujah. We are not called to argue. I told you some few years back, very rich man, I went to his house, he was to sponsor a particular business, give us some, some money to do a particular business. And so we went to his house, a very big man, rich man, but we found out that he was a, a canker. And so when he got to know that I was a preacher, then this church had not started. But I was evangelizing anywhere I go. And then he's now saying, you people, you're talking about Bible, Bible that, that you don't even know. You don't even know the source of that. Do you know that the Bible is not complete? What do you know? Do you know blah, 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 blah? I look this man, I say, because I can't find money for your hand, I did the talk like this. For my heart, I did talk. So, I told him, I said, sir, do you believe this Bible? Hey, which, which Bible, Bible? I said, so, you don't believe this Bible, then what is our reference point for the argument? I said, don't you think that it is empty talk where we don't have any point of reference? I said, please, let's do business. Forget this one. Carry your ekanka and go. I carry my Jesus and go. Make we do business. The man looked at my friend that took me there and said, who is this man? Who brought him here? I said, ah, sir, did I bring me here for you to initiate me into your cult? Let's talk business now. Which one concerns us with the Bible and the canker again? He said, you leave my house. I said, uh, uh, sir, excuse me, sir. Did you invite me to come to join a canker or to do business? He said, I said, leave my house. I said, no, you have not answered me, sir. He said, leave my house. Oh. I said, okay, okay sir. <laughs> and I left. Praise the Lord. Don't argue with anybody. Go and preach the gospel to the whole world. He that believeth and his pastor shall be saved. You don't believe. That's all I want to know. You either believe or you don't believe. Don't try to convince anybody. Or argue with anybody. The reason is, Apostle Paul said that Christ is the wisdom of God and the power of God. Hallelujah. Apostle Paul told us that if they had known this mystery, the princes of this world will not have crucified the Lord of glory. Hey, hey, hey. Hallelujah. You don't know the privilege that you have that God will call you to understand his divine agenda. The Bible says, he, God, made all things and for his pleasure. We are called according to his purpose. He displays his sovereignty. Apostle Paul, Romans chapter 9 tells us, who are you, clay, to answer the potter? Who has power to break you and remove you again? Hey, glory be to God. Hallelujah. When I see myself that I did not go to Bible school, I did not go to school of theology, Hallelujah. And then God can cause me not just to be part of it because God knows what he's doing. Of course, he must raise preachers. But generally, there is something God puts in you to believe him. And then he places you to follow him in the right path. Because it's not even all who hold this Bible. Hallelujah. That we make it. Some of them are foolish. And some of them are wise. Who are those that are foolish? They are foolish because they have the lamp, but they have no oil for revelation. They remain foolish until the door is closed against them. But we are privileged. Oh, glory be to God. He gave us the lamp and he gave us the oil. He gave us revelation. And it's not by power and it's not by might. Hallelujah. It's not he that will it, nor he that run it, but God that showeth mercy. 
And there's nothing we have to boast about. It's just such love, such wondrous love, such love, such wondrous love that God should love as in a such a sign. I wonder who is love like this. Hallelujah. Take note. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Listen. Verse 1 to 3. Let's read it again. It's a popular scripture. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Verses 1, 2, and 3. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. Now you be not so shaken in mind. He was writing in the first church age or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letters from us as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by enemies. For that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed the day, I mean the son of perdition. Now this revelation is in twofold. There is the revelation from the scripture and there is the revelation of him sitting now in the temple life. You cannot say, see him here. Hallelujah. And this revelation will come at the end time. And this revelation is part of the end time message. That's where I want to emphasize now. You believe a message, you believe a message. What is the message? It is the message I'm giving you now. He said, for you have heard that Antichrist shall come. Even now, a dear Antichrist. And God took time to show Daniel how this Antichrist will be. So in chapter 7 and verse 8, listen very well. He is revealed to Daniel as the little horn. His location. In chapter 7 verse 8, God was showing Daniel the location and that it will be found among, I mean, in the fourth beast, the fourth empire. And that he will be found in a city. He will be found in Rome. The Vatican. He went further to shed more light in chapter 8 and verse 9. When he said, talk about another little horn. Where we just studied today. He's trying to now let you know the nationality. The nationality of the man that Satan will use when he will be revealed. And the nationality is that he will be a Syrian. And that's why, amen, the story is put that way in chapter 8 and chapter 11. And all the emphasis is on that little horn. And that little horn is, hallelujah, it's known as the king of the north. And that little horn is the one tied by that Syrian general Antiochus Epiphanes. And all the description we see, it is just God trying to show Daniel the nationality. And every cardinal, like I said last time, is an automatic citizen of the Vatican. And the popes are selected from the College of Cardinals. It is always one of them that they are elected. They are elected to be the Pope. So the Pope can come from any part of the world. At the last, the one before this one, what was he? Is he an Italian? Where is it's from Holland? Okay, from uh, okay, from Netherlands. Okay, 
And then this present one now is from South America. Amen. If Christ tarries, the next one may come from Nigeria. Yes, because there are cardinals in Nigeria. Hallelujah. I think we have about three or four cardinals in Nigeria. Amen. Once you become a cardinal, you are a potential pope. Because any of them, and it's possible before Christ comes to balance it, or because no black man has been there, so that it will really look, you know, global. They may come to Africa, and with the population of Nigeria, I think they should give us. I mean, it's, I mean, they should give us now. So let's pray that they will remember us. So that we too, uh, we can have one now. We can have hope. Hallelujah. That's exactly what the book of Daniel chapter 8 God was trying to achieve. The nationality. The first one in chapter 7 was for him to know that it will appear in the days of the fourth empire. The fourth beast. And that beast is the beast with ten horns. And there's an eleventh horn. And that eleventh horn is what we trace. And then he came again and then, you know, that, that little horn, which is the eleventh horn, we see him again mentioning that little horn is for a reason. So that we can know his nationality. In chapter 8. And then he, you will notice that in chapter 9, Daniel chapter 9. Let's read Daniel chapter 9, verse 26. In the divine agenda that he gave him from verse 24, but from verse 26, there's a statement that is made there that makes it also clearer. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off in the agenda that was given to him from verse 24. For those of you who have not heard me take it before, when we come to chapter 9, you will get it. But I want to bring out something in verse 26. And after three score, and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood. And unto the end of the world, the solutions are determined. And this particular prophecy was fulfilled in AD 70. And so we will look at it that destroyed the city, we will look at it. Who were those that destroyed the city? He said, the, he said, they are the people of the prince that shall come. So he's telling him something else there. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. The people of the prince that shall come. And who were those that came and destroyed the city in 1870? They came from Rome. So Rome, Romans are the people of the priest that shall come. The Antichrist, that's what he's saying here. Letting you know that the Antichrist will come from Rome. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And watch it as we saw. Amen. In the next verse, Antiochus Epiphanes the Bible says he came by flatteries. He came by peace pact. Because they knew he was wicked. Nobody will allow him to take over. Amen. When his brother died. So he came by flattery. Peace, 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 peace. And if we read Daniel chapter 9 again. Let's read Daniel chapter 9 verse 27. Hallelujah. And he shall confirm the covenant. He shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And it is the Antichrist talking about here. The priest that shall come. He shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the middle of the week, the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abomination, he shall make it desolate. 
even until the consummation and that determination shall be poured upon the desolate. And so there is a covenant that is coming up. He will come. And what covenant is that? It's a covenant of peace. Why will he have a covenant of peace? Because a time is going to come, but something will happen the United Nations will be rendered useless. Something will happen that will humiliate America. Something will happen, praise the Lord, that the whole world will know that all these treaties we are having cannot work. We need a man. And it is only normal that they will look for the most respected man on earth. And that seat is warming herself into all religions now. And that's why the person occupying that seat, you see him freely go to the mosque, freely go to Hindu uh, shrine, freely go to Buddhist uh, shrine, and telling everybody we are one, it's the same God, we are one, we are one. And remember, on earth today, he is the most respected man. Hallelujah. With followership, a greater percentage of the population of the whole world are his followers. And so he will come with peace, peace, peace. And then, coney, coney, coney like that, he will find his way in Jerusalem in the temple. And he will endure for three and a half years. Like Antiochus Epiphanes, he will not show which demon is in him after three and a half years. Because the first three and a half years, they won 44,000 in Revelation chapter 11, chapter 7. They are anointed through the message of those prophets, two prophets in chapter 11. They receive, their eye, they receive the sealing of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And they go forth with the everlasting gospel. And they are there opening the eyes of the Jews. And he will endure it for three and a half years. The remaining three and a half years of that one week, seven years period, is that 1,260 days. Three and a half years. Times, time, times, and the dividing of time. Three and a half years. That is the period he stands up and that is the time that he shows who he is. Praise the Lord. That is when if you don't accept him as your God, you will neither buy nor you sell unless you take his mark. Praise the Lord. And so God was revealing that to him. Number four, we see that in Daniel Chapter 11 is the same thing he was making clearer and clearer from verse 36 to verse 39. It's revealed as that willful king that is described as a vile person. And in Daniel uh, chapter 12 and verse 6 to verse 7, we see the period of three and a half years, which is, like I said, the last week of the 70th week that God gave Daniel in chapter 9 concerning that divine agenda that we shall come to. And take note that Daniel chapter 7 verse 25 also confirms that the last three and a half years, that last 70th week, the half of it that we see, I just spoke about in Daniel 9.27, is the tribulation period which is what the angel was showing John in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 6. Jeremiah 30 verse 7 calls that period the time of Jacob's trouble. It's a very horrible period. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Therefore, 
the little horn that you see in Revelation chapter 8 that straight forth to chapter 11 its activities is nothing but the Antichrist presented in a foreshadow and the picture is clearly given there by the interpretation that the angel gave Daniel himself. In First Thessalonians chapter 2 where we read from verse 3 verse 4 Apostle Paul called him the son of perdition. The son of perdition. And I want us you know to take note of what the angel told Daniel, I mean told John in Revelation chapter 13 verse 9 and verse 10. Chapter 9 and I mean Revelation chapter 13 verse 9 and verse 10. Amen. Here it says if any man have an ear let him hear. Remember that is where he revealed the Antichrist. The beasts that come out of the water. He said, he that leadeth into captivity, that is the Antichrist himself, shall go into captivity. He that killeth with a sword is the Antichrist himself in the time of the tribulation, this is his end, must be killed also with the sword. And he added there, here is the patience and the faith of the saint. That is a statement that catch my attention. He described the certainty of the destruction of the Antichrist. And he added, he said, here is the patience and the faith of the saints. What is the patience and the faith of the saint? The patience, hallelujah, this revelation, knowing that he that is dealing with us, his own end to his coming. Amen. Having this assurance that it will not be forever, we are patient. And knowing this revelation, the faith of the saints is revelation of the saints. It is revelation of that agenda that gives us patience. That enables us to walk with God. Knowing where the whole thing is going to culminate into. Let's read 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Apostle Paul was reassuring us. 2 Thessalonians chapter, chapter 1 from verse 1. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Second Thessalonians chapter, chapter 1 from verse 1. This is the way he put it. Paul is talking to the saints. I want us to take from the greetings. Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus. It was three of them that were sending that message to the church in Thessalonica. He said, unto the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We are bound to thank God always for you. And remember, the letter to the Thessalonians, as we see, is a letter to the bride of Jesus Christ. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, necessary. Because that your faith groweth exceedingly and the charity of every one of you all towards each other abounded. So that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith. We glory for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. I want to stress this. Apostle Paul is looking at the church in Thessalonica and he is recognizing the sufferings they have been going through. The persecution they have been going through. But he was recognizing their patience. And their faith. Despite all the persecutions, 
And that's why all the tribulations they were enduring. Verse 5, which is a manifest token. I was meditating on this letter and something inside of me was just getting excited. Which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer. Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. That is our assurance. That is our hope. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, when he shall come to be glorified in his sense and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Philippians chapter 1 verse 28, 29 and 30. The same apostle Paul again. He made a very striking statement that caught my attention. He said, and in nothing terrified, don't be afraid of your adversaries. Which is to them an evident token of perdition. But to you, it is for what? Of salvation and that of God. For unto you, it is given in the behalf of Christ. <laughs> Not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. I read that verse again. For unto you, he said, this suffering is a token. What is a token? A token is something for remembrance. It's a sign that reminds you of something. The suffering you go through as a Christian is a token for one day we will remember it as the reason why we are crowned. Oh, glory be to God. Hallelujah. Let's read that verse 29 again. Hallelujah. For unto you, the believers, it is given in the behalf of Christ. Not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. And verse 30, having the same conflict which you saw in me and now here to be in me. Why is Israel suffering all that they suffer? All because they are God's chosen people. Nothing more. And that suffering that they suffer for God's sake. They are hated for God's sake. It's a token. Hallelujah. For that is what God sees and see reason to glorify himself in you. Therefore, you cannot because of suffering deny Christ. You are losing your token. Oh, glory be to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We are ordained to suffer. We are ordained to suffer. Apostle Paul said, all that shall live godly in Christ shall shall compulsory suffer persecution. And please, this persecution, they come in various ways. Some of them is physical challenge. Some is demonic afflictions. Demonic afflictions. Nobody can just go and attack Brother Cosmos Maduka. I hope you know that. Because it's connected enough physically. It's connected now. One phone call, he will call IG. They will not send DPO, they will send commissioner of police. So the best thing now is his factory. Finish it. Just like that. His factory. With goods worth billions of naira. Billions of naira. Bunt down. 
another job. Bunt, bunt down, bunt down. I met one of the deputy commissioner of uh, police, in fact, the present deputy commissioner of police, Lagos State. I was talking with him. And we got to this course, we talk about um, uh, Cosmos Maduka. He said, ah, he said he was the area commander. That they phoned him that there was fire that said he went. He said for three days, fire was burning. They could not stop it. He said he stood there. He said he saw the man. The man just came and folded his hands. I was looking. And then entered his car and went away. He said persecution. There was no reason for it. Woke up and everything burnt down. Push him. Say you be Christian. Say you be Christian. You, you know, you, we trust all men. We trust all men. With a business associate. And he went and said he will stand shorty for him. Don't worry. You know, let's help them. Let's help them. And we know Christian. Let's help them. You know, without signing anything because his word alone. He, 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 he collects loan without, uh, what do they call it? Without collateral. <laughs> yes. He said that man, everywhere they went to get shorty, he said they turned down. Managing director of bank turned down. This one turned down. He said this man, lie, lie, is it lie, lie. Somebody brought him to me. He went back to the MD. He said, help him. Help, help the young man. Help him. They gave him money. 16 billion naira. At the word of Brother Cosmo. Give him. Amen. And then the man. Yeah, four one nine. And this man, our brother, was part of the owners of the bank. He owned 25% of the bank. And they had to call him quickly, please. Sign, sign. Because if not, the bank will collapse. He said, sign that you are the one that guaranteed. Because it was with mouth. He can as well come and stand and say, we are, show me paper where I guarantee. Mona Chase, go collect your money. He said, all his management said, no, you must, no, I beg, I beg, I beg. Don't sign, no, don't sign that you, you are the one that guaranteed. Don't sign, don't sign, don't sign. He said, everybody was in, don't sign, don't sign, don't sign, don't sign. And he said, this is temptation. This is a test of my Christian integrity. Anywhere I go, I place Jesus here. Now, proof that you are a Christian. He sneaked there and went to say, bring the paper. He said, yes, I guaranteed that money that is lost. That means you have to pay back now. And you heard what he said. He said when he got back home, he said he was jumping as he entered his house. He shouted his wife. He said, I have won. I have won. I have won. And his wife said, what happened? You win waiting. He said, I have signed it. The wife said, hey, we are finished. He said, no. It was a temptation. A trial of his Christian faith. Is he not the one that said they should give? Now sign. And since he didn't have money to pay, they used all his shares in the bank, sold it. And now, to the last couple, he lost it in the bank. Why? His persecution is to break him down. To make it look as if this Jesus we are serving is in vain. It's not in vain. What he has gone through, going in the face to stand for truth and his integrity, to defend the name of the Lord that he is known by, is a token for his crown that is waiting for him over there. Oh, glory be to God. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I see people who will call me because they are looking for excuse. Pastor, see where I am walking. I am walking where I am selling. Where I am selling, I be at the sell. Pastor, should I resign? Now go tell you to resign. Abby. Every one of you that called me, did I tell you to resign? I said, no, go ahead. Go ahead, because you think you are smarter. Then when you come out, then you come and meet me, Pastor. Since you tell me, say, make I come out, I come out. No work. Now you say, make I come out. No work. No work. 
everybody, you will earn your token. Hallelujah. You will earn your token. Because we are called overcomers. What did you overcome? That will entitle you to a crown of righteousness. To that cloth. That white cloth that we see. Hallelujah. In Revelation chapter 19. With fine linen. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So that you understand Hebrew chapter 12. Let's read it verse 1 to 4. We are for. See we also are compassable with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sea which does so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. The patience of the saints. Verse 2. See who we are to look unto. See who we are to look unto. Who? Looking unto who? Jesus. Who is he? The author and finisher of our faith. We like to quote that scripture. Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. You stop there. Continue. Who? For the joy. That is where we are going. That was set before him. Endured the cross. Despising the shame. And he set down. His reward. We are. The right hand of the throne of God. Listen church. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Verse 2 again. See what he did in verse 2 again. He said, what did he do? It was for the joy that was set before him. That is a revelation. Of what is ahead of you. When you set your eyes on what is ahead of you. You will despise. You will endure the suffering. Endure it. I remember. The old rugged cross is an emblem of suffering and shame. He despised, I mean, he refused to despise the shame. Praise the Lord. And it became a token for him. Verse 3. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. Lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. You have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. You have not yet resisted unto blood. All of you listening to me now, nobody, none of us here, they have not hung any of us. They have not fired any of us because of the gospel. They have not killed any of us because of the gospel. Therefore, endure. It is your token. Praise the Lord. That same Hebrew chapter 12, verse 25. 25 to 29. See that you refuse not him that speaketh. And it's going back to the wilderness journey. For if they escape not, who refused? Who refused him that spake on earth? Much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven whose voice at that time shook the earth but now he has promised saying yet once more I shall not the earth only you will not, I shall shake not the earth only but also the heavens the day of the Lord and this word yet once more signifying Signify it, the removing of those things that are shaking, as of those things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Hallelujah. Because a time is going to come, the purpose of the shaking that God shakes, so that those who are approved will be made manifest. There are many people that have gone back, and they, they will say, I am backsliding. You are not backsliding. You are shaking off. Backsliding from where? The next verse. Hallelujah. Verse 28 again. Verse 28. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby 
we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Why? Verse 29. For our God is a consuming fire. Our God is a consuming fire. None that despise him will miss it. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Let's read from verse 13 to verse 17. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren beloved of the Lord. See who we are. Because God has from the beginning chosen you to salvation. This is our own. Many are called, few are choosing. This is how we are choosing. We are choosing to salvation through sanctification, holiness, righteousness, and the belief of the truth. Whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which has loved us and has given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, what shall he do? That he should comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. When you see letters that are written by revelated apostles, they carry weight. They write them from their innermost feelings, expression of what they know concerning God's plan for salvation. They go beyond this realm. Their attention is up, 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 up there. There's something they have caught that makes any other thing a distraction to them. They are focused. Nothing will stop them. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. And, 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 and that is how we are choosing. You cannot say, I am elect. And you still live a useless Christian life. You cannot say you are elect. You are hoping to go in the rapture. And you are living all this useless life. Today you are up, tomorrow you are down. Today you are up, tomorrow you are down. I'm saying this to wake somebody up. Let's read Hebrews chapter 10. Verse 26 and verse 27. Hear that admonishment from Apostle Paul. It's a warning. You know, I'm, I'm, so, I'm so happy because I am sure I am not wasting my time. There are some people that hear me and they respond. And there are some, those of you who refuse to respond. Hallelujah. We, we hear this word. It will be played on the tape for you on the last day. So you won't say you didn't hear. Let's go to that verse again. For if we sin willfully, because you won't say you don't know. In this church, we have spoken so much against fornication, against worldly dressing, against those stupid things you put on your head, against those nonsense paint, paint you paint to your body, sister, against adultery, against you who they thief thief your master money, and they come put them for offering. Against all of you who carry drug, carry cocaine. Against all of you that do the nonsense. Against lesbians and homosexuals. We told you that the same fire that consumes Sodom and Gomorrah is waiting for you. We told you. We told you. I am the Lord. I change it not. You know now. You know. You know. You know, you know, we have told you that you should not eat until you are pronounced husband and wife. Did we not tell you? But you chop now and you stood at the altar. You any impediment? No impediment. Meanwhile, there's an all seeing eye watching you, watching you, watching you. Every day, mind that cost you pursue. Watching you, watching you. There's a lot seen. Watching you. You 
why not get time for God to come? You know, they come to church, not because they have money. Make a rest, I beg. From Monday to Saturday, I beg, I beg, I beg. The only day where I get to rest now is Sunday. Ah, go bright now, you go stay now till evening. I beg, 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 I beg. What did happen? Brother Rafa, from the Savior today, risking your soul for the things that decay. Oh, if today God should call it away, what will you be? In exchange for your soul, oh, what will you give? Oh, what will you give? Hey, what will you give in exchange for your soul? Oh, if oh, today God should call it away, what will you give in exchange for your soul? As if any of these things we risk our life, chase it, we will take it with us when we live here. You see how Apostle Paul said, if our gospel be hidden, it is hidden only to them who the God of this world has blinded. And the cause of this world, now mammon God, God of money, that makes you believe the Bible said money answers all things. So why? You risk your life. Money, 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 money. And you live your life and your agenda from Friday to Friday, from Sunday to Sunday, you have no time for God. You have no time for your spiritual life. You have no time. Prepare yourself for that appointment that every one of us is awaiting all of us. Death. Every one of us, death. One day, if the Lord tarries, all of us here, yeah, one by one, we will die. Why? See the most stupid thing that can come on a human being. Fallacy, vanity, is never to think that this life is temporary. That every one of us will give account of ourselves to our maker. To give account simply means there is something that has been committed into your hand you are come to answer for. We are sent to this world for a purpose. How are you feeling that, fulfilling your own purpose on earth? Nobody is sent to this earth for the purpose of making money, of building houses, of buying cars. That, that is never, never. God didn't send us for that purpose here. God sent us here to glorify him. We are representatives of God here. To show Satan that I have my children here that will stand with me for better, for worse. He is the one that gives the power to make wealth. Hallelujah. I am not against you making money. I am against you making money so that your soul is risked to the detriment of your soul. You have no part for your soul. That is where I am. Look at our brother Cosmos. He's a billionaire. He is. Hallelujah. He has Free entry. He has free entry, according to what he told me, to almost 200 countries on earth. No visa. <laughs> so when he reaches the airport, he'll just give them his passport. They say, How long are you staying, sir? No, just for a meeting now. I'll be off uh, next tomorrow. Bye. Thank you. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. But wherever he is, number one, he put his badge, Jesus. They know him for that badge. 
He said he used to declare which side he belongs first, whoever you are. And he will never miss fellowship. A billionaire. Do you know the office he occupies in his church? He told me last week that he has been there for over 20 years serving as a deacon. He's a deacon. I've gone for a meeting in the church and he was among those serving us food. Serving us food. A billionaire. Yo, oh, because you get at least 200,000 for your account. Yo. <laughs> Amen. Oh, why, are you, why are you not offering any service in the church here? I was going to ease myself here. There is a particular brother, volunteer. Now he they clean this place off this toilet here. I saw him scrubbing it just as we were doing Sunday school. Scrubbing it, scrubbing it. And then you, 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 nothing. You just nothing. Even as you can sit down here, so even offering, you left your house, so offering. You spent five minutes, you were looking for change. And even with all the money you made, what did you give for a place you belong like this? For the kind of project that is going on. How much have you brought? What is your token? You know, the Bible says, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. The Bible says so. So let's go back now, verse 26. Let's read on. Hebrews chapter 10. Let's read verse 26 and verse 27. Hebrew, correct, chapter 10, verse 26 and verse 27. Those who have ear to hear, they will hear. If, for if we sin, will, will, willingly, willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, that we preach in this ministry regularly every day and even preaching now, there remains no more sacrifice for sins. What is it that is waiting for you? A certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. Go to verse 37. Go to verse 37. 37, 38, and 39. For yet a little while, our consolation, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. And that is our God, our Christ. Now the just shall live by faith. Listen. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Finally, but we are not of them who draw back unto perdition. But we are of them that believe to the saving of the soul. We will not draw back. That's why Christ said, remember Lord's wife. How can you leave the denomination that you claim you've left? You said that revelation make you leave. That's why I'm very, very careful. Very, very, very careful with people who say they have caught revelation. That's why they come to this church. I will watch you for some time first. Because some of you, you change address because you discover your pastor is, is a witch. That's why you left. Some of you, of you, it's because your pastor decided that you will not marry that brother. Or you will not marry that sister. That's why you vex, you come out. Some of you, you left because the pastor preached you one day at the altar. That's why you left. And some of you left because the church where you did, you know they prosper. You can't see say, somebody where they go bright, people say they prosper there, and I make you come. And some of you come here because you define wife. She say fine, fine girls, they, uh, the, 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 the church here. Yeah. Now make you come. And some of you now want team where they pursue you. Now you say make you come for deliverance. And some of you, you are here for protection because then they see where we're for anybody where one come. Make a join strong tower. I want to see those who are here because they caught a revelation. 
I want to see those who are here because their eyes of understanding have opened. The way the fellowship here is different. It's different. It's different. And how can you come this far and see go back again to those beggarly elements? That's why Apostle Paul told the Galatians. You're going back to those beggarly elements. These same things that you're supposed to leave behind, you go back to it. It's because you are not here with your heart. You are only here with your leg. If you are here with the heart and the call of Jesus Christ, it's not a call for you to come with leg. It's to come with your heart. And when that heart is anchored, God begins to deal with you in a special way. That is why he said, come out of her, my people. The whole of the book of Revelation chapter 18 and chapter 19 is only one message. It is the destruction of Babylon. And the voice of God calling his children come out of that system. And the Antichrist system is the denominational system. And we have proved it beyond everything concerning the scriptures here. And the message is come out. Come out. Come out of that system. And coming out of that system is not just coming out with leg. It is also coming out with the condition of the heart that positions God to lead you in a, by a relationship you have with him. Praise the Lord. By a relationship that we have with him. Hebrew chapter 3, read it. Hebrew chapter 3, verse 7. Hallelujah. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost said, today, if you will hear his voice, and that voice is the voice, is the shout, is the midnight cry. It is the voice of restoration. It is the voice crying and shouting, come out of her. It is that voice you are hearing now, exposing the Antichrist and the system to enable you have time to come out, come out, come out, come out of sin and life of carnalities and everything else. You say, God call you, God call you, and all you want to do with the call of God is how much you will make inside. How much, how much you make, how much. When they, they come to me, they, they, when they come to me, some run. I want to subject my ministry to you, pastor. I, I want to submit under you. Submit under me. Me, who I submit under. Where they come submit under me. Oh, that denominational hangover. That is how they, believe, they behave in Babylon. It's a Babylonian tradition. We have left Babylon. You're my brother, you're my sister. If you think I have a grace you can benefit from, you don't have to subject yourself to me. I know what you mean. You'll be sending your offering, your tithes and everything to me, Abby. Then I will call you the son of the prophet. That is how they behave in Babylon. It's a Babylonian spirit. No true love exhibited anymore. Nobody comes close to you except there is something to gain from you. In the church. So in the church we have class. There are some people that form a ring among themselves. And they call themselves brothers, another group, sisters. Sister of where? You are the same Babylonian spirit. You are the sister of Mary, Mary, Mary something. What, how do they call them? Mary, Mary. Eh, what do they call? Eh? No. For Catholic, heart of Mary. Eh? Sacred heart sisters. What do they Legion of, of Mary. Before you can become a member, you have to belong to the class. You have to see the kind of clothes where they wear. Which kind of business do they do? It's a Babylonian spirit. You have it here. It's true now. Amen. It shouldn't be. He said, Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost said, verse 7, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. As in the provocation, in the day of temptation in the wilderness, 
when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works 40 years, wherefore I was grieved with that generation and said, they do always err in their heart and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Take it, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today. Lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. While it is said, today if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. For some, when they had heard, did provoke. How be it not all that came out of Egypt by Moses? But with whom was he grieved 40 years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest? But to them that believed not, so we um, uh, and so we see that they could not enter in to that rest because of what? Because of unbelief. Because of unbelief. And the voice that is speaking now is the end time message. And the denominations turned it down. They want to continue with the Babylonian spirit. But you had a voice of this end time message. Please, ask your sister, your brother by yourself, are you in the message? No, ask three people around you. Are you in the message? Are you in the message? So come out of her, my people. Come out of it. It doesn't matter gospel. It matters. That thing they told you it doesn't matter is what will stop you from entering the rest that is awaiting all of us. When you come to this ministry, it is a restoration ministry. We are part of the attempt of God to restore back this Bible faith. To fulfill the parable in Mark 4 verse 26 down where the parable of the growing seed. It is planted. The seed begins to grow. And how it grows, the planter doesn't bother to know. But all he notices, it starts with a blade. Then the ear. Then the full corn. And when the corn, the fruit is brought forth, then the harvest, I mean the, the, the owner of the farm takes, quickly takes his sickle for the harvest has come. And he's talking about the growth of the church. The seed was planted at Pentecost. It died at Nassim. And the midnight cry began with Luther, with Wesley. Restoration of the world. Until we come where the fruit is formed again through the shout message of the seventh star messenger to the Laodicean age, which we believe is William Abraham. They are arguing if you say there is another one, bring him. We shall test him by the word. For now we have tested him by the word. And we see him as the star that has led us to the word. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And then, you know, when you begin to have a group that will not add nor subtract from the word. That will be ruled by the word. That will stand on the foundation of truth. And it is called the present truth. That you be established in the present truth. And the present truth comes by the latter rain. And the latter rain is the revival for the harvest. And that revival starts with these revelational things we are receiving. That will position you. Because there is going to be a shaking. And only those who are rooted in the world will be able to stand. Brethren, it is scriptural. We are expecting a shaking. And the shaking will continue. Pra praise the Lord. And only those who have loaded themselves with the word. And that's why I get very worried. That people will be in this church. And they are not interested in the word. You come to this church. Your time when prophets are pro prophesying. There's not, I'm not against prophecy. 
But I'm telling you that there is more we have than the operation of the gifts in this church. It is the revelation, the word of truth that is here. Be established in it. God confirmed to our daddy, Abayomi, that after now that he has baptized, he said, he should now be baffy with the word. And that's why I know that the spirit in him is of God. It's God that visited him. As the truth. See, peace has come upon him since he found the message. He's now relaxed and he's ready telling God, you cannot take me home. I have found it. And you here, you are joking with your own. Some of you come to this church by timetable. I, I don't, I, this month, I come first Sunday. I come second Sunday every month. The remaining Sunday, where do you go? Uh, now, nah, must work now. <laughs> God will help us. I have a message from the Lord. Listen to the musicians. <laughs> 